Penguin Random House Audio presents Codename Elen by Ariel Lawhon Read for you by Barry Krynick with Peter Ganim For my husband Ashley, forever and for always. Also, Sally Burgess, who told me we could no longer be friends if I didn't write this story next. And Elizabeth who makes the dream come true every single time. War is too important to be left to the generals. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, 1917. Part 1 Nancy Grace Augusta Wake the power of a glance has been so much abused in love stories that it has come to be disbelieved in. Few people dare now to say that two beings have fallen in love because they have looked at each other. Yet it is in this way that love begins, and in this way only. Victor Hugo, Les Miserables Hélène Benson Military Airfield, England February 29th, 1944. I have gone by many names. Some of them are real, I was given four at birth alone, but most are carefully constructed personas to get me through checkpoints and across borders. They are lies scribbled on forged travel documents, typed neatly in government files, splashed across wanted posters. My identity is an ever-shifting thing that adapts to the need at hand. Tonight, I am Hélène, and I am going home. It is February 29th, Leap Day. The irony of this is not lost on me, because I am about to jump out of an aeroplane for the first time. I've only just been lifted into the belly of the Liberator bomber like a clumsily wrapped package. Me in slacks, blouse, and silk stockings beneath my coveralls, tin hat, and British army boots. The camel head coat and parachute pack don't do much to help the ensemble. But this isn't a fashion show, and I'm not here to make friends. So I don't care that every man on this plane is looking at me as though I don't belong. Besides, I'm hungover, and I think I might throw up. There are only four of us on this flight. An RAF pilot, a dispatcher, Hubert, my partner on this mission, and myself. A motley crew indeed. I settle into the jump seat across from Hubert, and we watch with trepidation as the aperture in the floor closes. There's a grinding of gears and the clank of metal, and then we're locked inside. I very much regret that third bottle of wine I shared with the boys last night. Headquarters delayed the mission by an entire day so we would have extra time to memorize key details of our cover story, which meant that, for the second night in a row, we raucously celebrated our looming departure and likely death. By the end of it, we were singing Blood on the Risers at the top of our lungs, and now I can't get the stupid song out of my head. Gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die, I hum, only to find the pilot staring at me with a bemused grin. I shrug. It's the truth. This would be a hell of a way to die. Too late now, though because all four engines shuddered to life with an angry bellow. I begin counting as the plane rumbles across the aerodrome. Ten, twenty, thirty. Good grief, when will this thing ever get off the ground? Forty? And then my stomach drops as we lurch into the air like a drunken seabird. The Liberator heaves and rumbles its way into the low-hanging clouds over the English countryside, sounding all the while as though someone has tossed a pound of bolts into a meat grinder. Once we're through the clouds and the engines dim to a lesser roar, the dispatcher looks at me and shouts, Which? Under normal circumstances, I would be offended, but which is my code name for this flight? I nod in the affirmative. He turns back to his control panel and radios command. Which on board? A pause and then a glance at Hubert. Pudding as well. Approximately two hours until the drop. Poor guy, it's not his fault. He's not been given our real code names, much less our actual names. Need to know, etc., etc. 
I make a face at Hubert and he grins. We'd argued over which of us had the worse handle. Mine is sexist, but his is stupid, so in the end we declared it a draw. At least the plane is heated, I say. But Hubert has settled into his jump seat, closed his eyes, and is trying to sleep. If he hears me, he doesn't let on. Hubert is not what you'd call a conversationalist. I grow queasier as the Liberator bounces ever higher, and I'm trying to decide whether to throw up now or later, when the dispatcher drops into the jump seat next to me. You don't look like a witch. Is that really what they call you? He asks. Sometimes they put a bee in front. He's American and Texan, and therefore a gentleman, so it takes him a moment to realize this is a joke. My mama would yank a knot in my throat if I used either word for a lady. Lucky for you, I've rarely been accused of being a lady, I say with a wink, and I haven't been married so long that I don't enjoy watching him blush. The dispatcher looks at me a bit closer, taking in my strange attire. We ain't never dropped a woman before. We? He nods toward the pilot. We make this run three or four times a week, but you're the first girl we've ever tossed out. Get used to it, Tex. There are about ten coming up behind me. Well, I hope you can do what the men haven't. Which is? Get this war straightened out. I'd like to go home. He returns to his radio, and I try to find a comfortable position. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as sleep when you're in the belly of a bomber rocking back and forth trying not to puke. It's enough for me to swear off booze altogether. Well, maybe I'll just take a break. This is war, after all, and a girl has to find comfort where she can. After several minutes of quietly willing my stomach to settle, something lands in my lap. I open my eyes and see a brown paper bag. Inside is a spam sandwich. Heaven help me. I look up to find our pilot leaning halfway out of the cockpit, one hand on the yoke and the other extended toward me holding a canteen. Here, he shouts. Drink this, it will help. That's very kind, but coffee is the best cure for air sickness, he says. And then, drink it, you look awful. The truth is I feel several degrees worse than awful, so I unbuckle and scramble onto my knees to reach for the canteen. The pilot is big and sturdy, deep, soulful eyes. I don't typically go for the mustache type, but his is nice. If I weren't hung over and married, I'd think him quite attractive. He offers me that same bemused smile, then returns to his duties when I've relieved him of the canteen and situated myself in the seat once again. The coffee is hot and black, thick as tar. I take half of it slowly like medicine and then use the rest to wash down the sandwich. At least he has been generous with the mayonnaise. Only when I've finished, my stomach is settled and my ears are no longer popping, does it occur to me that he has sacrificed his dinner for my sake. As I wipe the crumbs off my lap, I notice that the dispatcher is staring at my outfit. I look ridiculous, I know that. But everything I need for the next six months has to be carried into France on my person tonight. And there is no way to accomplish that without appearing homeless or possibly deranged. Finally, he shakes his head, perplexed, but I'm used to it. I have that effect on men. Across the way, Hubert is sound asleep, head lolled to the side, snoring. I'm not sure what he's wearing underneath his coveralls, but I bet it's nondescript and civilian. Perhaps not so expensive as mine, but Hubert isn't the flashy type. He errs on the side of stoic Brit with a stiff upper lip. But his French is excellent, which is why he's on this mission. I don't exactly sleep, but I do finally settle into the flight, and an hour later, the dispatcher taps me on the shoulder. We're 30 minutes out from the airfield, but stay buckled, the descent will be bumpy. Turbulence? Nah, the Germans like to send their greetings as we come in over the coast. Are you telling me that they will be shooting at us? Yes, ma'am. But don't worry, we've done this a hundred times and we ain't been hit yet. I am about to audibly curse Major Buckmaster for withholding this bit of information when the first deafening boom shatters the air above us. Bumpy.
Sample complete. Ready to continue?